Hey, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Today, I'm very excited to introduce our guest for the day, Josh Andrews. Josh, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sucha. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, very excited to learn about what it is that you're excited about in the real estate space. I know you do a lot of notes investing, but are also involved in other types of real estate investing and otherwise, and excited to learn from you. So why don't you start us off, Josh, by sharing a bit about your background and how and why you got into the real estate space. Sure. Yeah. So I, um, not going too far back, I grew up in a really small town in North Idaho called Sandpoint. And um, I knew getting out of school that I didn't want a normal job. Just my personality doesn't, didn't really click with like a normal W-2 type job. So immediately I was looking for how can I kind of create passive cash flow. And at that time I knew nothing. So I was just kind of learning as I went. And um, was this high school or college? A high school. Actually. Okay, awesome. I never actually went. I know it's bad to say, but I didn't go to college. And <laughs> not, the reason... it's not bad to say in the real estate space. <laughs> okay, good. Because a lot of a lot of people I say that to and they're like, well, I didn't need it because I had friends that were going to college and it was more or less they did it because they didn't know what they wanted to do with their life. Just kind of a placeholder instead of an actual location. Right. So like if you're going to be a doctor, you need to go to college. You need, you know, specialized training. And I just didn't have anything that I could identify right away that I wanted to do, you know, so I didn't end up going. Um, but I did do a number of small entrepreneurial stuff and with the idea of passive cash flow, that was always my goal. And I stumbled around for a few years trying to figure myself out and figure things out. And I eventually ended up moving to Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I have two younger brothers and they were living there at the time. So I figured, okay, it'd be nice to just hang out with them be in the same town. And I was working, uh, I needed a job. So I was working at a, a bank while well, more of like a, it's more of like a kind of like a credit union slash private lender. So they had call centers and they would essentially um, have loan officers, right? Like, so I was a loan officer and they would give you a call and you would essentially walk people through uh, either refinancing or getting a new home loan, things like that. So I was licensed, did all that. And that was a really good learning experience. And I couldn't really understand at that time how banks and credit unions and lenders were really making money because they were lending this stuff out to people at, at three, 4%, 5%. And so I couldn't just wrap my head around if there was any opportunity there for the average person like us. So, you know, I was going along doing that and I actually had a phone call with a guy who was kind of a mentor. He was a, a wealthy older guy and he had rental properties and I had saved up some money and it wasn't a whole lot, but it was enough for down payment. And I'm like, okay, I want to go get maybe a duplex or something, right? Like I'd studied everything I could outside of pulling the trigger. And he said, you should really look at uh, mortgage notes. And I said, well, you know, I'm selling these at the bank here and I just don't see how I would ever be able to live off that income because if it's just interest, I mean, it's three, four, five percent, I would need to have millions to kind of live the lifestyle that I want in the future. And he's like, well, there's a whole nother side to these things that you could take a look at. And so I ended up kind of going down that path, still having, you know, one foot in my day job and learning and taking nights and weekends and studying and uh, buying my first mortgage note, right? Finding a mentor completely by accident. And from there, uh, that was in, I think my first note was in 2012. So it was a while back. And from there, just got totally hooked on it, jazzed about the whole thing and has grown up until now where, you know, that's where I, what I do full time. We raise capital, we have a staff, I have a wonderful partner. Um, but that was, that's kind of my, you know, movement from then till now of finding what I'm good at, right? What I'm, what my skills are combined with where I want to go as far as cash flow and investments. Um, and then of course I invest in other things as well, but that's my day to day is, is the notes, mortgage notes. Yeah, for sure. I think you bring up an important point that every person, there are different ways to make money in real estate and every person has to kind of figure out what is the, the path they want to follow. And, um, there's oftentimes serendipity involved, right? Like you said, you met your mentor completely by accident. Um, but if you just keep at it then and kind of keep 
the end in mind, um, then you will make progress, right? And if you just keep making progress and having the right mindset, then the sky really is the limit. So, um, so what was it that he taught you about mortgage notes that helped you think, okay, well, maybe this is something I want to pursue further. Sure. So the first guy, the uh, wealthy guy that just kind of made an offhand comment, Hey, you know, you should check your notes out. Um, I dismissed him originally. So I was like, okay, let's talk about the real estate thing. Cause I want to buy some real estate. And I can't recall how I actually met the, the real mentor that I'm talking about that walked me through this. But um, he said to me, he said, the thing that got me excited was he said, you can buy these things for, for much less than the borrower owes. So basically a discount. I didn't understand that at the time. Um, I actually started with him in non-performing, it's going to sound crazy, but non-performing second liens right? So not even a senior lien. It was a second lien on a residential property that's occupied. The borrower hasn't paid for like five, 10 years, right? So it's just kind of crazy. But he said, look, we have spreadsheets of these things that the banks are selling. Uh, you can, has the amount that they want for them. And it was literally like 10, 20 cents on a dollar, like tops. And he's like, this is what you do. And this is what will happen. It's going to take about a year. So I said, okay, well, I can, I can take a couple small calculated bets. And if it doesn't work out, I'm okay with this, losing this money, you know, um, cause I'm a big believer in that, not going all in on any one thing, no matter how good that seems. So I said, okay, here's my, here's the money I'm willing to lose. Gave it to him. He managed it, walked him through the process. We'd have weekly calls, et cetera. And I just started learning and. I'm like, this is, you know, money that's just kind of laying on the ground uh, in, in a lot of cases. So I got excited about the discount part of it first. Mm -hmm. uh, discount meaning, let's say the borrower owes um, 50 grand on a, on a small loan. You might buy that if it's non-performing. You might buy that for 10 grand, right? So you've got all of that room to profit, to negotiate with the borrower. And I thought that was just a tremendous deal. Um, how many of those could I do? Yeah. I didn't have a lot of money. So yeah. Just for the listeners who aren't familiar with this, although, you know, we have covered this, but it's been a while and, you know, not everyone listens to every show. So how does that work with the first lender if you're in second position? Yeah. So uh, the first lender is still there. Uh, typically they're being paid and there's, so they're current, the borrower's still paying them, but they forgot about us mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't forget necessarily. They just decided not to pay. Yeah. And uh, so the first lenders there, they do have the first right of um, being paid off. Right. So in the, in the event of a sale, if you sell your house, if, um, you know, any number of things happen, if there's a foreclosure, typically the first needs to be paid first if they're foreclosing. But the beauty part about how I started with the seconds is it's really you can still foreclose from second position. And so whoever takes it to sale, whoever starts foreclosure first actually gets paid first. So it's a weird dynamic of um, you don't have to pay the first off. It's still on the property, but it's in the borrower's name. Okay. So it's a real, it's almost like an option. You, you could think of it almost like an option on a house where you got in for a little bit. We have complete control over the whole thing with the idea of modifying the loan for the borrower, right? So you want to modify that $50,000, like in that example, you're not trying to kick this person out and, and hurt them. You're just trying to modify and get them repaying on the debt. Um, yeah. So it's, a, it's an interesting model. Yeah. But the first is still there. Yeah. Very cool. And so, um, you know, how did you end up deciding you wanted to make this sort of your day-to-day, -day, how you are making money? Uh, well, my dream after I started, after about a year with this mentor, I had bought a, a few loans. He had worked them out and they're paying again. I said, well, it'd be really nice to have a whole spreadsheet full of these things and they're just mine, <laughs> yeah. right? Because then there's my income that I'm looking for, the passive income. Um, so that's what got me excited about it. Yeah. And then my mentor was telling me, well, there's a lot of these out there at really good prices like this. I can get you as many as you can buy. And I said, well, I don't have a lot of money myself, but what if I could bring in like friends or family or something? 
And that's how it started where I think my brother and like one of my best friends that I grew up with, you know, they threw in $20,000 each kind of thing. And then we did a couple and they got paid and they were happy. And so like, oh, let's do more. So it kind of grew organically that way. And, um, you know, my ultimate goal was to, like I said, have a big portfolio of those that are paying. Um, but that's kind of when I knew I'd say after the first year, year and a half of doing it, I was really excited about the whole model. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And how did you decide that you liked notes, you know, and enough that you wanted to not that you, I know you do a little bit of real estate investing, but that was what you were originally interested in. So yes. how did you decide you wanted to focus on notes instead of real estate? Investing? That's a great question. So I, I still love real estate. I, there's a lot of things that real estate has that notes do not primarily possible appreciation and also a lot of tax advantages that notes just don't have. Notes are primarily interest income. So you're being taxed that way. Uh, what steered me more towards notes at that time was I didn't have a lot of money and, you know, I'd saved up over several years enough, what I thought was a healthy down payment for maybe a fourplex or a duplex or something. And then I would run the numbers over and over. And I can't tell you how many like, you know, calculations I did to try to see, you know, what the cash flow would be and all these moving parts. And I just came to the realization that I would need to have so many of these, you know, cause you're buying them with a mortgage, right? so many of these to ever reach the cash flow that I wanted or a moderate number, but they would have to be all paid off in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. So, which is still a totally legitimate way of doing it. Right. Like I'm still open to that, but then I was seeing notes and I'm like, well, this is like money, very consistent mailbox money. And I can replicate this. Right. And then I can buy real estate for the, for the other aspects, right. Kind of balance it out. So yeah. I think that's what got me more towards the notes after I was just looking at the my situation, my cash flow situation initially. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways to um, put the pu piece of the puzzle together. But I like to tell people, earn, invest, repeat. So you have to have a way that you're able to scale your earnings um, so that you can invest more and have a bigger passive income portfolio. And over time, like for me, I have a, a business, which is my short-term rental business. And I try to scale, I, I use those earnings and the profits from that to invest in real estate. And so, and then I also have, you know, my capital raising business. So that um, helps me um, transition to having a bigger passive portfolio and a smaller active portfolio over time. And it sounds like that's kind of, something like what you had in mind as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big believer in that. I think that's the right path, you know, as you're earning, whether it's a day job or whatever that cash flow stream is, putting that into more passive, whether it's real estate or whatever else you want. So it's growing for you in the background. I mean, that's the whole, at least to me, that's, that's the goal. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, let's talk about, you know, we are in a recession or approaching a recession, um, what, does, what are the impacts of the macroeconomic conditions on notes, um, non-performing notes? Sure. So we primarily do, so I started non-performing. We do a lot of performing right now. I mean, we okay. still have a large portfolio of non, but- um, And wait, so what's the business model with performing notes? Sure. So we basically have two buckets. So you've got the non-performing that I talked about, it's really dry to find the market right now is really competitive and really dry. So it's tough to find stuff that pencils out. So we're not buying anything in that right now, but we're growing another bucket basically, which is performing loans. So that's a mortgage like, you know, you might have on your house where uh, you get a statement every month, you make your payment, that sort of thing. So it's that boring, but we, we buy those at a discount again. And you know, there's a special kind of funnel we put those through to make sure they're profitable, but we buy those and we're growing that side of the business where investors are getting paid and we just have a really stable, like growing mountain of performing loans, right? So, um, so it's a really I, cool model. Why would a mortgage holder sell a performing note at discount? Yeah, that's, we get that a lot. So I would say 
So notes are originated a couple different ways, uh, either maybe a private entity, right? Ma and pa, like a uh, owner finance or uh, like a bank or credit union, right? And so credit union or a bank, typically how we or someone on the secondary market like us would get that is it may have been non-performing at some point. And it could have been years ago and it was modified or reinstated where they're current now and they're back on track. And then the bank sold it because it wasn't paying. So they wanted to get it off their books. It's more of an accounting thing. And so it comes down to the secondary market to people like us. So we'll buy that. And as long as it's performing, we'll put it in our portfolio. The discount part is, is a function of, of um, the time value of money. So essentially, investors like you and I, we have kind of a, a, a base amount of return that we're willing to accept. Right. So, uh, you know, it might be 6%, it might be 15%. It just depends on what your comfort level is and what you can normally get with your other investments. So, if a borrower is paying, most borrowers aren't paying 15 or 12%. So, if a borrower is paying 6 or 7% or 4% on their loan, if you don't have a discount and you just buy it at face value, you're just getting what the borrower is paying. So, you're only getting that 4% or that 6%. And typically, that's not enough to satisfy most investors. So private investors like you and I, we know that. So there's going to be some discount that plays into it uh, when you buy or sell. And how much is kind of a complicated thing, but we just have software that tells us, you know, what that should be, what the price should be. Okay. So, and the, the purpose for the other, the sellers to, or the mortgage holders to sell is that they want to do something else with their money. Pretty much. Yeah. So there's um, private people that might have a handful on their own, maybe in their IRA or something. And then there's companies like ours and then even much larger who have you know tens of millions of dollars and they, they just, they're just caring about the profitability, right? So they bought it for X. They might have collected payments for a year or two years, and then they can sell it for maybe more. Maybe the market's heated up and they can make another five or 10% on it. And if they have a portfolio of that, you know, that could be very, really substantial. So it's hard to, it's hard to see how they're profiting unless you know what they bought it for and everything else. But their, their motivation is, is, um, you know, a maximum exit, but they do know, they do know that there needs to be a discount. Otherwise they'll just never be able to sell it. Okay. Got it. Interesting. So in turn, for you as a note purchaser, um, like what would you say the um, benefits and drawbacks are purchasing performing notes versus non-performing notes? So the benefits are it's much easier. Uh, there's a lot less moving parts. There's a lot less due diligence. So non-performing notes, there's a whole statute of limitations because they haven't paid in you know a number of years. There's other material issues with the title and deed, and it can get really hairy. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of effort that goes into that when you're buying those. The performing loans are pretty pretty straightforward. And the benefit of buying those, I would say, is it's a lot more sustainable because there's just a mountain of those out there pretty much indefinitely to buy. And once you build that, it's a very stable portfolio where it's not, you're buying something, it's non-performing, it's going through this door and you're foreclosing, you modify it, and then you sell it for profit, and you have to find more to buy. The, the business model with the performing stuff is you're just kind of putting it in this bag, and the bag keeps getting bigger and bigger, and you're paying your investors, and it's just super steady. Okay. Um, so boring, not as high you know, returns, but very still competitive returns, and much easier to manage much easier to satisfy maybe investors who are a little squeamish about some of the risks with non-performing stuff because there is risks there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would say that's the difference. The The reason people get into the non-performing is when I started, obviously, I mean, it was for the money because you're getting such a high return mm -hmm. that that's where you get kind of directed to. Yeah, for sure. And and especially if you are kind of wanting to grow your capital more quickly, it seems like yep. that would be, you'd be more willing to take on a little, maybe folks are more willing to take on a little bit of risk, but over time they become a little bit more risk averse. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. Very interesting. I hadn't heard about the performing note space. So that's 
Um, so then who are the people that typically hold the performing notes that you would purchase? Um, so when you say when they hold them, like the sellers or- Yeah, the sellers like are the we, the Yeah, sellers so the sellers are essentially, those are, uh, you know, other funds, other high net worth individuals maybe, or uh, funds like ours, or even sometimes banks. So we have some bank relationships that- you know, they have a loan that they just don't like, or it's been a problem child for them and they just kind of want to get rid of it. So there's a, there's a big market for that, a large secondary market of buyers and sellers, pretty sophisticated that uh, are always buying and selling that kind of stuff. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, okay. And so in terms of like, you know, it's February of 2023, late February, um, what are you thinking about in this space as it relates to um, your notes buying? And the, the, the well, other. what am I paying attention to and kind of thinking? Yeah, yeah. In terms yeah. of like you know the macroeconomic conditions and how that might affect your business. Sure. So there's a lot going on. I think that most investors are looking at. You've got yeah. inflation. You have, um, you know changing real estate prices in some areas, you know, fear of like a, a massive drop in, in value. Um, you also have interest rates, the federal interest rate, you know, how does that play into it? And the short answer for a lot of that stuff is, you know, interest rates, if the Fed raises the interest rate, it doesn't really affect us that much if you're buying and holding a performing loan because it, that only that affects new money if you're going to go out and get a new mortgage, right? Or if yeah. you're going to get something on your property. It doesn't affect my ability to pay my mortgage or my borrower's ability because that's a fixed commitment. They already know what they're going to pay. They've been paying it. So that doesn't really affect things there. Um, some of the things that do affect like our business is property values, right? Because the property is the underlying collateral. You have the the note, which is essentially the IOU, which outlines the terms. Yeah. And then you have the mortgage or deed of trust, which is the security instrument against the property, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the lender's essentially collateral, kind of the last resort to go take if the borrower stops paying. So when that collateral value fluctuates, of course, that does matter. But primarily it matters only if you have to go sell that property. So if my borrower is paying... Um, we are keeping a very close eye on that property value, but if it goes down $50,000, because these are single family homes, the borrowers are not just, you know, packing their bags and leaving. They're, they're, they have their kids in school. This is their home. There's a lot of emotion behind that. So it's something to watch, but really the only time it really matters is when you have to take possession of that property back, right? Like what's securing the money that you've invested. So that is something that we keep an eye on. I don't personally think we're going to see like, you know, a halving of values. I mean, maybe yeah. play in places like Phoenix or something where you see that kind of, you know, huge swings, but in general, I think it depends on the area. So we'll yeah. we watch that. That's a concern. And then of course, inflation, inflation is a complicated topic, but it's essentially, you know, government's printing money and devaluing or, um, I guess devaluing is the right word, money. So something that costs a dollar today will cost a dollar twenty-five next year. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So savers are losing, um, and so what you want to watch out for there is just being investing your money somehow, whether that's real estate, whether that's notes, whatever it is you're interested in. I think that's really so key right now uh, yeah. with inflation. So those are the things that we're watching, and of course. Um, you know, there's all kinds of due diligence stuff that we do in the background prior to purchasing loans. But those are the three things I would say we get a lot of concern over from investors. Like, how does this affect this industry? And fortunately, you know, two of those are really not a big deal. Inflation is something it's in fact kind of affecting all of us. And that's not something you can change or you and I can change really. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, Josh. Thanks so much for sharing about um, the note space and how, you know, you learned about it and and some of the different considerations. Um, as we start to bring this home, I, I'd love for you to just share a bit about how you um, 
how and listeners can learn more about you and anything else that you want to share. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I authored a book in 2017 called Paper Profits. And so it's a physical book. If your listeners would like a free copy, there's no selling. There's no, you know, trying to get them to do anything in this. It's just education about notes. And I actually created this with the thought, you know, if my mom asked me, what do you do? <laughs> How do I describe that to her in a layman's terms, right? Like right. so she could understand. Um, so there's a link on our website, or I can give you just a, I don't know if I could drop it in here if you just want me to say it, but there's a link there where if they go to our website, they just input their info and we'll actually ship them a copy of the book. Yeah. Um, well, if they would um, like that. Yeah, you can go ahead and um say it just so that people who are listening could maybe write it. Sure. But then also yeah. we'll put it in the show notes. So I will say we are getting a new website revamp. So the website we have is not terrible, but it's not great. Um, so the website is paperprofitsinvestors.com. So paperprofitsinvestors.com. Okay. And as soon as you get there, you know, it'll have a, a link there saying, hey, get a copy of Josh's book. Um, and it usually takes about a week for us to ship that out. So, awesome. but I'd be happy to talk to anybody about real estate stuff, about notes, about what we do. Uh, we do raise private capital. So for certain people, uh, we do manage, you know, passively this kind of thing. So um, that's a whole nother conversation. I'd be happy to talk with your listeners if that's of interest. It's not for everybody, um, but if so, they can reach us on the website as well. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And who would you say notes investing is like, what, what is, what are um, investors who it is a good fit for? What are some of the characteristics of those investors? That's a really good question. I, so there are, there are people that it's not a great fit for. So I would say that the primary people that I have seen that it's not a great fit for are people that want to do everything themselves. So they want to, they want to learn it all themselves, meaning uh, teach me how to teach me, go how to buy notes and show me where to get them. I want to do it. That's probably not a good fit for us because we, that's just not where our focus is. People that it's great for are people that might want to diversify their portfolio. Uh, I wouldn't say put your money, all your money in one thing, anything, um, including what we do, but it's a good thing for people with maybe an IRA who want really stable, predictable income where they can say, Hey, there's something here to go take if things don't work out, right? There's underlying collateral, like in real estate syndications and things. And uh, people that are more patient money, where it's just consistent, you're not going to double your money in a year, but you are going to see significant returns. So people like that, that um, are okay with being educated, of course, what they're investing in, knowing who who's kind of driving the ship but also more of a passive type of thing where hey there's a portion of my investment here there's a portion of my investment there that that type of thing awesome yeah yeah makes a lot of sense and appreciate you breaking that down well thank you so much josh for sharing um that resource with folks and um i, I definitely encourage listeners who are interested in the note space and sure. who's this has piqued their curiosity to follow up with Josh and re get his book, which, um, did your mom read that book by the way? I, she said she did. I didn't watch <laughs> her. I, I think she did. But I, I actually have a, a picture of my, my dad and I, when I was younger in the back of the book and he read it cause he had, he had talked to me about it. So, um, I'd like to think she did. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> That's awesome. I love, I love that, right? Because so much of what we do in the space, it does need to be, you know, those of us who are in real estate, there's a lot of lingo and jar jargon and like, you know, you start to understand this language, but for someone who's new to it and wanting to get into it, um, it is really important to be able to break it down in layman's terms. And so I'm really glad that, that you made that resource. So thank you so much, Josh, for coming on the show and sharing all about notes. Really great to meet you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. I had a great time.